Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, Merry Christmas. How are you, Summit? Yeah. You know, it's only three days. In case you didn't know, ready or not, here I come, three days and it's Christmas. I know some of you went out and uh, did some penance yesterday. You shopped on Saturday, right? And uh, you're a whole lot smarter than I am, amen? And uh, I know some of you are, have questions rolling around in your head. In fact, some of you woke up early, early, early this morning, panicked, thinking, is he going to like my gift? Is she going to like my gift? Or maybe some of you ladies in the room are wondering if you bought enough food. And so you're going to be going to the grocery store over the next couple of days, making those last minute runs and uh, making sure you got enough uh, eggs for deviled eggs, amen? Because you can't have Christmas without deviled eggs. Anybody else, amen? Love Jesus. Jesus want to go to heaven? Why are they called deviled eggs? They ought to be called the Holy Spirit anointed eggs of Jesus. Amen? I, I mean, come on, man. I mean, those things are good. And, and by the way, if you're a parent, let me go ahead and remind you of this right now, because here's what you don't want to be stuck Saturday, uh, Wednesday morning. If you do not have double A, triple A batteries, go get them today. Amen? And go ahead and pick up those D size and get the nine volts, because to buy D batteries at a convenience store on Christmas morning. Is about $97. Amen. So uh, <laughs> go get them now. Uh, I'm telling you, you know, those are great questions, but they may not be the right questions, right? Because if you're just honest this morning, I, I, I think as I've thought about this, and every year this comes around, so one of the kids asked Jake the other day, he said, Hey, Dad, when's Christmas? He goes, You're not going to believe this. They moved it to the 25th of December. And the kid went, Dad, but you know, every year as I get ready to preach a series on Christmas, I struggle. And I always think, you know what, how, how do you change the Christmas story? How do you get to the Christmas story? I mean, how did we get here? What is this all about? And whatever it is, did it really happen? You see, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at doubt and we've been looking at some of these things we believe. And for so many of us, we really don't know how we got here. I mean, when did we start spraying the inside of our home with fake snow? <laughs> Amen? See, I grew up in an interior decorator's home, and, and, and my mom was in home interior. So we had like 97 trees in our house, and, and we started in August, and I've had enough Christmases to last 10 lifetimes. Amen? And, and so when did we start dragging trees into our home and putting lights on it? And, and, and when did people start randomly going around knocking on doors and singing? <laughs> Christmas caroling? Amen? I mean, I think bad people in hell have to do that for a thousand years. Get anybody else with me? I know some of you are mad at me right now. I get it. And, and when did someone start drinking eggnog? Really? That is like the most disgusting thing in the world. Amen. I don't care who you are. Don't send me an email telling me it's good. It's not, okay? It's nasty. Don't drink it. Okay? No, I will not. And don't Google me either and telling me why we have Christmas trees and lights because I don't care. Okay? So... The question comes out is, is why do we do what we do? And, here, and here's what I've boiled it down to, and I think you do too. And, and even if you don't believe this morning, and as I was sharing this morning with our TV crowd and our Facebook crowd and, and those that are watching us that, uh, online, we all boil it down and we know, whether we're believers or not, that it goes back and we can't trace it with a straight line. We really can't connect it. We just know that there was this historical man named Jesus that was born. And all this craziness that we do and all these things that we are, are part of and all the parties that we're a part of, we can trace back some way, somehow that it goes back to this guy named Jesus, a historical figure 
that it's a birthday party. I remember when my mom switched over and it was about the time we, we had grandkids enter our family and, and, and before that it was just Christmas and it was kind of crazy. And then when grandkids came along, my mom turned it into a birthday party and, and so we had a cake and we'll probably have a cake this week and, and where the kids make the cake and they put candles on it and we sing happy birthday Jesus. And, and the first time we did it, it felt weird. I'll just be honest. Um, and I know I'm their paid Christian professional and it shouldn't feel weird, but it, it felt weird to me, okay? And I think it's okay to admit that. And, uh, uh, but see, here's what I know about birthday parties. Birthday parties are supposed to be just that, aren't they? Parties. And yet, here's the, here's the thing that happens every year at Christmas. I go around and I talk to people in the first service, second service, during the week, we get phone calls, and, and it seems like this is not a good time of the year, is it? Because when I think about it, if we're honest, the world we live in is not good. Let me say that again. Not everything is good. There's sickness. There's legal issues. There's divorce. There's tragedy. In fact, we know that the world is not happy or beautiful. In fact, real evil exists in the world. You don't have to believe in Jesus to know that. Just read the international section of the news. Just Google it this afternoon and read what's going on, the terrorism and war and genocide. And then go ahead and jump to the national news and, and you can go through and look at kidnappings and lies and scams and yeah, impeachment and mass shooters and all the things that are going on. If that's not enough, just read the Tyler or Longview paper or the Mineola Gazette and you'll find all that good stuff of rape and abuse and shootings and mental illness and murder and arson. Or if you're like me, you just read ESPN. Real spiritual, huh? <laughs> uh, look at ESPN and the drug use and abuse and the illegal gambling, cheating and adultery. And then there's the entertainment section. We don't need to go there, amen? Amen. You see, I don't think any rational person would deny that we live in an evil place and it exists. And here's what we believe at Summit Heights. Here's what we believe as followers of Jesus. And I know not everybody in the room claims to be. You're here today because your mama said you have to be here and we're really glad you're here. Amen. Your girlfriend said you're coming and so you're here and you've not been to church in years. So listen, I, I'm glad you're here, but here's what we believe. And here's what we believe that, that, that the reason there's evil in the world is because of sin. As I said last week, sin separates us from God. It's sin that separates us from God. It's our sins that cry out for justice. And that's why God sent Jesus because his justice dealt with our sin. And, and we know that because even if you don't believe, you know that's true because when you read those entertainment sections, the international sections, the local news or anything else where you see an injustice or somebody is taken advantage of, there's something in you that rises up and said, somebody needs to pay for that because that's the justice that's rising up in you for your sin. See, your sin is crying out for God to judge it. And that's why Jesus came. See, we've all sinned. And when we sin, it brings evil in the world. And you, you may go, well, they had all this talk of sin. That's, that's why I left church. And, and I get it because some people, that's all they talk about is hell and damnation and all that. But listen, there's a reason we talk about that so much is because that's why Jesus came to set us free from that. And say, so we don't want to be that church that browbeat you and beat you over the head. We want you to know what sin is and your sin separates you from God. But yet we want you to understand that, that all this talk and all this thing of sin, that's why Jesus came. And I hope you'll understand it's important to have a proper understanding of sin. That I don't want to beat you up. Because see, you're already condemned, the scripture says, because of your sin. And we are already condemned because of our sins. I don't need to beat you up anymore. You already know that, if you're honest. You see, to understand what sin is, we got to frame it. So let me give you some simplicity of sin. Because if life is a machine, then sin is that bad gear in that machine for you engineers in the room. That no matter how much it runs and no matter how much you try to make it run, with that bad gear missing a tooth, it'll never run the way it was designed to run because it has sin. And you see, we know that if life's a family, then sin is a feud between family members. You ever been there? Some of you are going to be there this week. Amen. You hadn't talked to him since last year when you had to sit with him. Amen. So you know about that. If life is a body, then sin is that untreated disease called cancer that unless treated, it will ravage the body as so many of us have been a part of. If sin 
life is a computer, then sends that virus that destroys the hard drive of a PC, not a Mac, of course. Amen? <laughs> Macs are saved, not PCs. Anyway, um, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. You get it. You see, simply this, sin is an attitude or an action against God. So where did it start? Where did sin start? It started with the very first couple, Adam and Eve, back in the Garden of Eden. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, look at it. It says this, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to who? All people, because all sin. You see, before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no death. The death came into the world because of sin, because Adam and Eve chose to be disobedient. But see, sin didn't stop with just Adam and Eve. We've all been sinning since then. Every one of us in this room, there's not a single person on earth who is always good and never sins. Now, you may string a couple of hours together. You may even string a couple of days together where you don't sin. You're better than I am. That's all I can tell you. But there is no one that's always good. Heck, I've never met met anyone that claimed to be perfect. And I know that because I don't even live up to my own standards, let alone God's. Amen? Anybody else there? <laughs> I disappoint myself. I disappoint others. I don't live up to a perfection. See, sin is a universal problem. The scripture says all of sin. That includes me. That includes you. It includes everybody who's ever lived and ever will live. In fact, the scriptures go on to say in Romans 3, look at it. It says there is no one. Everyone say no one. There's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Are you catching a, a pattern here? All have turned away. They've all together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, indeed, there is no one. Everybody say no one. No one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. That's why 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, if you think you've never sinned, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. You see, the scriptures tell us about sin. To understand sin, we got to go back to what scripture says. So I'm going to give you four meanings in the New Testament of scripture. So maybe this will help you. And maybe if you still think you haven't sinned, then maybe you might find yourself here. Because see, one word that scripture uses for sin, which means to miss the mark, wandering from the path, or going astray. How many people I've had conversations with through the years is ask them, when did you leave the faith? In other words, when did you get off the path? And immediately they'll go, it was in college, or it was in ninth grade or it was when somebody or somebody did this. See, sin means to miss the mark or wandering from the path, but it also means falling short or not going far enough. See, every one of us have been guilty in that, have we not? Or how about this one? It means going beyond our destination or beyond where you should stop. See, some of you in this room connect with that one because that's what you did at the office party this week. You went way beyond what you should have, amen? amen. And there's video of it. Yeah. <laughs> See, we find that, don't we? Or lastly, pollution it means being unpurified or being made dirty or polluted. You see, when we look at sin, we understand what sin is according to the scripture, that we've all missed the mark. We've fallen short, not gone far enough, or we've gone too far beyond our limits. We've all have attitudes and actions against God. How did we get here? How did the world get so messed up? It got messed up with Adam. And then we all followed an example and we were born into sin. And that's why last week we just stopped and we said, this is why the virgin birth is so critical to the gospel. This is why the virgin birth is so critical to everything we believe because Jesus was not born of a man. He was born in righteousness of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit came and he, she, he caused Mary to become pregnant. If he'd have become pregnant, she'd have become pregnant by a man, then Jesus would have entered into sin and he could not enter into sin. And that's why the virgin birth was so critical for us to enter in that Jesus would enter through righteousness so that you and I could be made right with hell. You see, every time I sin, it damages something, either me, someone else, but ultimately my relationship with God. And the reason the world's in a mess is because we've all sinned. And the result is everything on the planet has been damaged, injured, spoiled, or corrupted. You see, God created the world to be in harmony, to be in harmony with him and with us. But when sin entered the world, it is now what we call a fallen world. In other words, it's messed up. 
You see, the real reason we celebrate Christmas is that sin entered the world. And the world needed a savior. You see, Christmas is not just about Christmas trees and fat men in red suits. It's about Jesus because we're sinners. And we wouldn't have Christmas if there wasn't for sin. It was sin that we celebrate Christmas because at Christmas, we got a savior because the world needed to be saved and we needed to be saved. You see, the result of sin is we live in a fallen world and we know this, our planet is broken, isn't it? With natural disasters and deformities in our world, nature doesn't always act in a a rational way, does it? I mean, you just live in East Texas, you know that, it's irrational. With hurricanes and droughts and earthquakes and all the things that we face, the answer is simple, the planet's broken, it's fallen. In fact, Romans 8.20 says that, the, that, that creation was condemned to lose its original purpose. That when sin entered the world, that, that literally the world was no longer in harmony with God. That it was groaning. It doesn't work in the right way. It's confused. Global warming is not something new. It's because of sin, people. That the earth is groaning. And we can deny it all day long. And, and we can line up with whomever. But listen, the world is broken. And it's because we live in a broken planet because sin entered the world. But we know that. And we also see it in physical decay and death because death was not a part before sin. When sin entered the world, not only was the planet begin to deteriorate, that's when death and decay came about. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. But though our outer man, our body is decaying, For those of us who have our hope in Jesus, yet our inner man, we've been given a new heart, is being renewed day by day. Listen, our bodies are failing. They're decaying. And listen, I'm bringing the lights up and it doesn't take long to look around. It's true. Amen? Don't get mad at me. I got up yesterday, the other day out of the garage, we were out there smoking a cigar and we were enjoying and visiting and all that. And and I went to get up and it sounded like a submachine gun going off in my knees and my ankles and my hips. Amen? Amen? Not everything works in our body because we're on a fallen planet. You see, if we were on a perfect planet, there would be no need for doctors, but we live in a fallen world. And our bodies will embarrass us at times when that knee goes out and you go down. Our bodies will become sick and die. And the reason is, Scripture says, it's because of Adam. It's because of sin. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. For since it was by a man that death, sin, came into the world, it's also by a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, one of the reasons we die is that God doesn't want us hanging around a broken planet. He didn't want us living in sin. He didn't want us to stay around there. To live on a fallen planet for eternity would be hell. God said, I didn't make you to live in a place of imperfection. That's why he sent Jesus. See, one of these days, God's going to shut this whole earth down. Do you know that? He's going to shut it down. And it's going to be it. And the reason he doesn't is because God is patiently waiting on those who are not in the family to come into the family and have every opportunity to be a part of the kingdom of God. And the earth is even groaning, waiting for that day that Jesus will come back. In Romans chapter 8, all creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. The whole planet, the whole physical world is groaning under the pain of sin. But we also know because personally there is an emotional distress and disappointment because of sin. And some of us are living that this week. Some of you are so stressed out and disappointed. And the reason is because we live in a fallen planet. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but most things don't live up to their hype. You ever notice that? I think most things are overrated. I remember when I was growing up, I wanted a Porsche 911 Carrera twin turbo. Yeah, I was godly growing up, amen. I remember I got one for a week and I got to drive it. And after I drove it, I was like, huh? Kind of overrated. So then I moved on to a Corvette. 
And I wanted a Corvette and my buddy gave me a 2014 Stingray in 2014, so it was brand new. And, and he gave it to me for two weeks because he was in Brazil. He said, the key's in the cup holder, go get it. I was like, <gasps> I drove it around. Oh, it was good. Loved it. I was like, eh. Point A to point B. Cars, boats, fat houses. See, you know what I'm talking about. Because most things are overrated, aren't they? That's why some of you are having garage sales so you can fill your closet full of those things that you've got to have. But those are those same things you got rid of that you had to have last year. Amen? Because most things are overrated. You know, I do a lot of marriages. And when young couples come to me, they, they're, they're so excited to get married. And they spend, some spend a whole year on getting married. And some spend even two years on getting married. And, and dads just cleanse to their wallets and hide them and buy safes and lock their wallets away because their daughter's going to spend it all. And, and I always kind of love watching the dance as a pastor when the young couples come to me and go, hey, pastor, would you do our wedding? And, and would you be a part of it? And, and I noticed in that year's transition, the, the bride becomes tanner and tanner and and. and and thinner and thinner and the guy all of a sudden starts shaving and he's never shaved and, and they're moving towards that day and they spend all that time looking at dresses and all that and, and when a couple comes to me the first day, here's what I tell them, I said, I'd love to be a part of your day but here, here's what I need you to do if you want me to be a part of your day, I need you to get premarital counseling. Oh, pastor, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. And here's what I want to look at them and say. Tell you this, the wedding event is not gonna last. It's gonna be about two hours, maybe five, and if your daddy's rich, six, amen? Because <laughs> those places are expensive to rent, I'm telling you. And, and, and I don't care how good your video is, the event's not gonna last because here's the goal. We don't want the event to last, we want the marriage to last. And if we would spend as much time on picking out the color of the tablecloths and the napkins as we did on premarital counseling, all of a sudden it would change. Which leads us to the second point because for many of us, we have an emotional distress and disappointment because of our sin, but we also have a relational distance and discord. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, it not only alienated them from God, it alienated them from each other. You see, sin will do that. Sin will alienate us from each other. See, all marriage, all relationships, all friendships, all relationships, period, come down to one word. You know what that word is? Sin. Sin. All marriage problems, all friendships, all relationships, every relationship you have can be boiled down to one sentence. You ready? You might write this down. Here's the one sentence that all problems start with. I want what I want, you want what you want, and here we are. And that's when the sparks fly. Isn't that true? I remember Danielle and I got in a fight six years ago at Lowe's. You ever been in a fight in Lowe's? <laughs> Man, it was over a toilet seat. Life-changing stuff, amen? Because that's what fights are, aren't they? And so I did something that I thought was just brilliant. I, I let her know she wanted this one and I wanted this one. And we had just replaced all of our toilet seats here at Summit, 13 of them. And uh, I, I, I told her we needed to buy this one. And she said, I don't want that one. I want this one. And so we got in this argument about which toilet seat was better. And I'm talking about we're mad at each other over a toilet seat. And finally, I thought, you know what? I'm going to solve this. Sweetheart, you need to understand, I run a multi-million dollar group called Summit Heights Fellowship. And I buy toilet seats every day. This is the toilet seat we need. She said, fine. I walked off going, dang right. <laughs> Two years later, we're in counseling. <laughs> True story. Two years later, we're in counseling, and she brings up the toilet seat. <laughs> so, I man, I puffed my chest out because my buddy who's counseling us, he's a pastor, and I thought, you know, he's going to understand this. So, I just threw out my life. So, let me tell you something. I run a multi-million dollar uh, corporation, man. We buy toilet seats. All that. This is the toilet seat that lasts for eternity. Amen? <laughs> I never forget what he said. He goes, you're a bully. <laughs> I want what I want. She wants what she wants. Sparks fly. Sin. That's sin. 
And that's it in emotion, right? See, here's the bottom line in relationships. You either grow up or you grow apart. You either grow up or you grow apart. Those are your options. A marriage, friendships, relationships. You're either going to grow up and learn to be unselfish and think about the other person, or you're going to grow apart. And people will look at me, well, we're just incompatible. I, I was on the treadmill this last week, and I was walking along, man. I was listening, I had my headphones on, and I heard this statement, and I had to get on both sides of the treadmill. I had to stop and write this down, because here's what incompatible means. You ready for this? Incompatible is a synonym for immaturity. You might write that down. See, you're either going to grow up or you're going to grow away from each other. It's your choice. If you want to be selfish, you're going to have conflicts the rest of your life. Unless you learn to grow up and give. See, Adam and Eve had a great intimacy before sin. And when you look at that story, it was an innocent intimacy. The scripture says they were naked and unashamed. And it wasn't just for physical matters. There was an emotional nakedness and unashamedness in their relationship. It was perfect. They understood each other. They didn't cover anything. They were unashamed, Scripture said. They were perfect. They understood each other. But when they sinned, it ruined the whole thing. It messed up their relationship, that intimacy of understanding that each other became fear and hiding and distrust and shame. In fact, the Scripture says in Genesis that they suddenly felt ashamed the at their nakedness, not just their physical that internal, that they took fig leaves and they strung them together and they tried to cover themselves. And men and women have been trying to cover themselves ever since. It's sin. And I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about emotionally. We hide from each other. We don't want to let anybody close to us. We don't want them to know us, so we cover it up. And that's what sin does in relationships. It causes us to cover it up. You're afraid of revealing your true self. And so you hide. You hide from your husband, you hide from your wife, you hide from your friends, you hide from your small group, you hide from your church. See, that's what sin does. You don't let them know your deepest fears. You don't let them see you on the inside. Every relationship in the world has been damaged by sin and the evil that's in the world, but I can't go on because, see, Adam also did something and when sin entered the world and God confronted him as Adam blamed. That's the way we deflect, is we always want to blame. And he looked at God and said, ultimately, it's your fault. If you hadn't created that woman, I wouldn't be here. And nothing's changed since. You see, sin affects emotionally, brings disappointment and discord, but it also brings a darkness. Sin leaves a hole in our heart. And probably one of the most famous comments and, and quotes that I've come across is from Pascal. And when he talks about the God-shaped hole, that there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. That you have a God-shaped vacuum that can only be filled by Jesus Christ, that can only be filled by you and I surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we try to fill it with sex and money and popularity, addictions and hobbies and chemicals and sports and careers. It's like putting a square peg in a hole that was only designed for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we may be known through his sacrifice and his resurrection. And without that, there's a darkness. See, what we need is God. And that's the message of Christmas, that we're all sinners, that we're all sinners in need of a God. And so many of us in this room, including me, we try to get our needs met with music and money and sexuality or anything else, and it's not the answer. And you know that, and I know that. And although the world is great, and there's so many great things in the world, there's natural disasters and decay and distress and discord and discontent. I mean, it's no wonder we're the most medicated society in the world when you start looking at all the depression. And I would be depressed if I thought this was the end. But thank God it's not. Because the message of Christmas is that we're sinners. And the good news is God acted. I mean, how can we be happy in a world full of pain and suffering and sorrow and brokenness and bad memories how can you be happy on a broken planet? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you. There's this guy in the Old Testament named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah wrote two books. One of them is called the book of Jeremiah. 
Okay. Duh. The other one's called the book of Lamentations. And the book of Lamentations means sorrows. And in Lamentations, listen to what Jeremiah says, and maybe you find yourself in that this morning. He says, I cannot find peace or remember happiness. And that's where some of you are this morning. You're looking for it. You've looked for it all your life, but you can't find it. Just thinking about, just thinking of my troubles and my lonely wandering makes me miserable. And that's where some of you are. You're miserable. It's all I ever think about, and I'm so depressed. And then he says this, this is the good news. I remember something that fills me with hope. The Lord's kindness never fails. If he, talking about God, had not been merciful, the Christmas story, Jesus, we would have been destroyed. The Lord can always be trusted to show mercy each morning. So deep in my heart, I love this. I say, Lord, you are all that I need. I can depend on you. That, that phrase, Lord, you're all that I need. It's the antidote. It's our salvation, by the way. It's your salvation. Lord, you're all that I need. I'm depressed. I can't find my way. I, I'm trying to fill that hole with everything there. Nothing satisfies. And God, you're all I need. And that salvation, when you and I surrender, that's Christmas, by the way. See, some of you tried to put your trust in people and they've let you down. And circumstances that's disappointed you. And things that don't last, cards break down, houses fall down, amen? And what we find is there's only one thing. Lord, you are all I need. You see, God's in control. And we see the reason the world's in a mess, it's sin. And we, we see the reason we celebrate Christmas is because of sin. Because in our sin, God sent Jesus, born of a woman under the law at the perfect time. And for generations, we've been celebrating Christmas, that God came near. So how do we respond to that? You see, I've blown it, you've blown it, Adam blew it, and we see the results. So how do we respond how does God want us to respond this Christmas season? Let me give you four things. Number one, receive God's grace daily. And, and, and listen, there's two types of people in this room this morning. There are those who have received God's grace and those who haven't. For those of you that haven't received God's grace and your first step, is to realize that your sin separates you from God. In fact, in Romans 3, 23 and 24, it says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You'll never reach God by coming to Summit Heights. If that's what you think connects you to God, it does not because you will fall short. As great as this church is, as great as this building is, as great of music as we have, as great a program as we have, we will all fall short of the glory of God. But God treats us better than we really deserve, and that's grace. Because of Christ Jesus, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sin. See, it's more than going to church. It's only through Jesus Christ that we are set free. You go, how do I do that, Edward? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at Romans 10, 9 through 11. And I love the amplified version because here's what it says. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, in other words, recognizing his power, his authority, and majesty of God, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be what? Saved. Saved. For with the heart, a person believes in Christ as our Savior, resulting in his justification, that is, being made righteous, being free to the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, whoever adheres, trusts, and relies on him, Jesus, will not be disappointed in his expectations. Listen. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and I know some of you come every week because this is a safe place and we designed it that way. We want it to be a safe place for you to investigate the claims of Christ. But can I just be honest with you this morning? At some point, I'm not gonna love you all the way to hell. Do you hear me? Relational evangelism is important. But if all I do is love you and never tell you the real state of your being, 
then I'll love you straight to hell. And I don't want to do that. Because your sin separates you from God. And if you've never responded to his grace by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, then friend, listen to me. You are not saved. You're religious, but you're not saved. And so your first step this morning, in just a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to pray, we're going to respond, we're going to sing. Your first response, because the rest of the steps don't matter if this step's not done. For some of you in this room, you've been in church all your life. And it's time for you to respond by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. For some of you, you've done that. And so that step is simply every day. It's just as Jeremiah said. Is God, you are all that I need. Sometimes I do that 38 times before 7 o'clock. Amen? A.M. Amen? God, you're all I need. <laughs> See, here's the second thing. Is remember this. Not only do we receive God's grace daily, we remember this place is temporary. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes. Don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in fashions and toilet seats. <laughs> amen? <laughs> Don't get too enamored with the things of this world or followers or, or, or all those likes and Snapchats and all that because listen, everything's gonna vanish one day. All this is going away. And there's only two things that last for eternity, God's word and God's people. And listen, I want you to be a part of God's people. I love you. I may have never met you, I love you. I don't want you to live without Jesus. And there's only two things that live forever and that's God's word and his people. This is all temporary. And scripture says that I'm only here on earth for a little while. This world's not my home. This world's not my home. I only have one king, and his name is Jesus. It's temporary. And here's the third thing I would tell you, and this is probably where I struggle the most. And I'm just being honest with you, is you gotta reject man-made solutions. See, the world is broken, sin and evil which means we have unmet needs because this isn't a perfect place. In fact, some of you have personal needs and relational needs. Some of you have sexual needs. You have the need to be understood, to be loved, to not be lonely. You have financial needs. And the easiest thing to do as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to take things into your own hands. See, the scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. And you see, I think about that list and maybe you have all those needs. Maybe you have a, a, a medical need this morning and the easy thing for you is to take that into your own hands and do something and not wait on God. For Danielle and I, where we struggle is when we have a financial need. And it's so easy for us when we have a financial need, we're facing a financial need right now that we, we keep praying and asking God, God, would you do this? And God, would you provide that? And, and it seems like when that financial need became real for us, every day we get a check in the mail that we can cash and it's a loan at 19% interest rate. Anybody else getting those right now? And you know how easy it would be for me? Well, God, you hadn't provided well, God, I know you, you've given me a free boat and you blessed me with a truck about four months ago and it doesn't cost me a thing. And God, I don't know why you're not gonna do this. So I'm just gonna take a loan and do it man's way because that's what the world tells us. And it's so easy to do it the world's way and it would be a really, really big mistake. And that's why some of you are struggling. And the last thing I would tell you this morning is because of sin, Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he saved us. And now God wants us to testify, to go tell, to go tell. You see, once you know the meaning of life, that Jesus died for our sins so that you and I could live in forgiveness. And once you experience in that, I'm telling you, you can't help but pass it on. And see, for some of us, we have forgotten it's been so long because we're so enamored with fake snow and fake trees and lights and caroling and, and doing all that. And listen, that's all fun. And listen, we'll do it this week in my family. But let's not forget the real reason Christmas exists is because of our sin. And because of our sin, God sent Jesus to take care of our sin issue so that you and I could live in forgiveness. And he wants us to go tell it to the world. The Bible says, go into the world. 
like a breath of fresh air and share the good news. You know, it's that time of year where I, I get tired of Christmas carols, but there's two that I love. There's two that I love. Um, I go fishing most every Friday and a week ago Friday, I was out on the boat at Brookhaven and I had my jam box. I did it again. Um, I'm dating myself. I had my Bluetooth speaker um, on the boat. Some of you don't even know what a jam box is. Um, and one of my favorite Christmas songs is by Bob Seger. Can I get an amen? Little drummer boy. I listen to it year round. I was listening out on Brookhaven, do a little fishing, had Bob Seger. I mean, Bob Seger's just close to godliness. I don't know, but I, I love him um, and just love listening to his voice and all that. But the second favorite song when it's done well is that old African-American carol called Go Tell It on the Mountain. Can we sing it together? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, the mountains in the Old Testament was a barrier. The mountains in the Old Testament were a barrier. In fact, that's where men would go up to meet God. Let me tell you what makes Christmas so different is God came off the mountain and became one of us. <laughs> that no longer is the mountain a barrier to God. The mountain is only one thing, is to get on top of it and shout, Jesus Christ is Lord. Go tell it, church. Go tell it. See, that's the glory of the Lord. That the mountain of God is no longer barred from his people. It's no longer a barrier for his people. It's now one place that we can get on top and shout to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we have Christmas. Is that we were sinners and our sins separated us. Now, through him, God with us, Emmanuel came and lived among us and he died. You see, not only does Christmas point to Jesus, it also points to Easter, his death, the culmination of his life and his resurrection from the dead so that you and I may be forgiven. That's Christmas. Merry Christmas, a bunch of sinners. <laughs> Amen? And so am I. The question is, there's some of you in this room that's never surrendered your life and you need to. So I wanna give you an opportunity this morning. Can we pray together? Lord, I love you. I thank you that we can come into this place and be honest and laugh and cut up and enjoy you and enjoy each other. After all, it's a birthday party because you came, you saw us, you heard our cries you saw our rebellion and you loved us anyway. And you sent Jesus to die for us in the form of a baby that every year we celebrate, that every year we celebrate the incarnation of God, that you became one of us, that God became man, fully God, fully man, to live among us and 33 years later die on the cross as a perfect sacrifice for our sin in our place, should have been us. But we've now been justified and made right by his sacrifice. So Lord, I pray for that one this morning, that man, that woman, that child that realized they're a sinner, that they've fallen short. Some ran so far past the mark, God, they, they're still in recovery, but they're sinning and they're sinners and their sin separates them from you. And God, you offer us something we don't deserve, and that's grace, that if we'll just confess with our mouth that you're Lord, your power, your authority, your majesty, believe in our heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. God, whoever believes in you and surrenders to your authority as king will be saved. So God, I pray for that man or that woman or that teenager in this room this morning that's never surrendered their life to you. 
that God, you'd give them the courage in just a moment as we respond to maybe turn to their mama and daddy or turn to the friend that brought them or God, give them courage to step out and come and grab one of our elders or prayer team by the hand and say, I need to get saved. I need to confess him as Lord. Or would you give them courage? And Father, for those of us that already know that and have a relationship with you, God, as we take communion this morning in worship, let us remember the body and the sacrifice that Lord, as Jeremiah said, you are all we need. So Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. And thank you for Jesus. And we ask everything in his name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand together. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.